So I would like to welcome everyone to today's EPRS event. Today's event is about the enlargement of the European Union. We are taking the 50 years of the first enlargement of what was then the European Communities in 1973 as a starting point. At that time, the community of the six member states was enlarged for the first time by the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland and Denmark. Uh, and of course, since then, we have had 50 years of several subsequent enlargements and debates about possible future enlargements as well. So this event will try to connect the past experience of enlargement to questions of more recent enlargement, especially the Eastern enlargement and possible future enlargements of the European Union. Uh, introducing the event today will be uh, Mr. Simetschka. Mr. Simetschka is a vice president of the European Parliament. He's also a Slovak member of the Renew Group uh, since July 1919 and vice president since January 2022. His responsibilities in the Parliament's Bureau include democracy and human rights, and he's also responsible for the Members' Research Service and the Library of the European Parliament Research Service. A member of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality is also the new party leader of Progressive Slovensko. He has previously worked as a senior researcher at the Institute of International Relations in Prague, has served as an advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, and has also worked as a journalist for the Slovak Daily SME and the Financial Times. He holds an MPhil and DPhil in Political Science and International Relations from Oxford University. Mr. Cimetschka has kindly agreed to introduce the event's scope and focus. Over to you. Thank you so much, Professor. Th thanks very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I would just like to say at the beginning that I'm glad and honored to be to be a part of this panel. Uh, and, and just to say that uh, I won't be speaking to the substance and to, to uh, of the matter because that's what our experts are for but i like to just briefly kind of out, outline the key questions uh, and issues that uh, are later to be touched upon and just as a brief um remark at the very beginning i mean i, I think this is uh, and i would like to thank the prs for organizing this not just because it's 50 years of the of the enlargement of of the uk and ireland and denmark but but it's also you know, uh, extremely important to talk about enlargement as such at this at this particular juncture when we uh, we have decisions on Ukraine, on Moldova looming. Uh, we uh, we have we're in the middle of, of discussion on how to reinvigorate enlargement in the Western Balkans. What will the uh, the decisions on Ukraine and and Moldova possibly Georgia mean for the Western Balkans and for EU's enlargement policy as such? So I think it's it's also from this perspective a very very timely debate. Um, and I have to say also that uh, it's also from the historical perspective, it seems to me that enlargement is somehow always been with the European Union. That there's never been a point in time in the history of the EU where it wasn't enlarging or it wasn't in the business of enlargement or, or negotiating accession or, um, or, or, or implementing an accession. So, so, so in, this, in, the, in this sense, it, uh, it continues. Uh, and of course, but now we're focused um, on, the, on the enlargement 50 years ago. And, and uh, as Professor Kaiser said, this was the UK, Denmark, uh, and Ireland on the 1st of January, 1973. At that time, uh, it should be mentioned that Norway was also in the process of negotiating accession, but then there was a negative refer referendum result, so it did not join. Um, uh, of course, at that time, uh, we already had a European Union an accession or an association agreement with Greece, and there was a prospect of, of membership for Greece. And there was also rumored a possible application for membership by Spain, still under Franco at that time. So this was the, the context in which these three countries joined. And when I said at the beginning that enlargement was always with us and it was always part of, of EU policymaking, uh, and it was often uh, the demands from, from countries that wanted to join or wanted to associate with the EU that has propelled the discussion um for and, and and have been until until the present day and of course one of the key notions here is what are the conditions for membership and this has been an ongoing discussion which have which was more and more you know became clearer and clearer and sharper and sharper as the time went on so for instance back in uh, 1962 the european parliament uh, adopted uh, the so-called the, the so-called 
Birkel, uh, Birkelbach report, named after social democratic rapporteur, uh, which tried to stipulate uh, for the first time that democratic constitution of a country should be an absolute precondition for membership. And this was uh, in response to, uh, to the rumors or to the possibility that Spain under Franco uh, will, uh, will try to apply. And then, and since then, a long journey to, to the definition of, uh, of conditions for membership or to the specification of those conditions. Of course, everyone knows about the Copenhagen criteria, but then they were uh, finally also ingrained in the, in, in the Lisbon Treaty. One of the other uh, points of discussion that was always present in, in, in enlargement policy and in debates about enlargement policy was this question or this uh, uh, contrast or juxtaposition of deepening versus widening. So whether uh, enlarging the EU would, uh, would necessarily have to mean uh, that it would stop deepening the integration, that it would hamper its um, you know, institutional, economic and cultural integration, because as the EU, that was the logic, because as the EU grew um, wider, it, it cannot possibly at the same time uh, grow, grow deeper. My personal point here is that the last enlargement, the big enlargement, of which my country, Slovakia, was part, was part of disproved that logic, but, uh, but it, was a, it was an ongoing debate. And in fact, it was sometimes also used politically. Uh, you, could, you could say that um, uh, UK's Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher at the time, wanted to use fast enlargement of the EU also perhaps as a way of, of uh, slowing down uh, the internal deepening. Uh, finally, on this, uh, on these sort of issues that are often discussed when it comes to uh, enlargement is the issue of, you know, what are the benefits of enlargements for the, for the accession countries and for the EU? And again, this would be my personal observation is that this issue is rightly, or this question is largely settled, that the benefits for both large accession countries and, and, uh, and the EU as such kind of outweigh uh, all the possible costs. And this, when it comes to, you know, simply larger markets, more efficient allocation of resources, export opportunities, growth, welfare, and, and needless to say, you know, democratic consolidation, although this is for the moment a bit of a problematic, um, a bit of a problematic statement given, you know, what we've seen in Hungary and Poland, but overall, I, I, it's, my, it's my strong conviction that enlargement has benefited, all of the enlargements have benefited both the EU and the countries that exceeded. Now, today's event will focus on the three accession states uh, 50 years ago, but also, as, as Professor Kaiser said, try to connect their their joint journeys and their experience uh, before and after 73 to the to the experiences of, of later accession countries. The 1973 enlargement, as as you well know, is often referred to the or is often referred to as uh, as a northern enlargement because the three countries uh, lie in the north. But they are but they have had and, and, and still do have very different characteristics and and exceeded at a, at a you know different point in their internal evolution at that time. The United Kingdom was, of course, a former empire, just withdrew from east of Suez. Um, Ireland was a former colonial territory, part of the empire until 21. And then Denmark, a fiercely independent state. Um, this, all of these have, uh, have kind of different, entered the European Union with different dispositions. Um, you also might recall that at, at that time, the United Kingdom was uh, was in the middle of a debate about, you know, it's what at that time seemed to be an eternal economic decline. Ireland was a heavily agricultural country, still dependent for 80% of its export uh, on its former imperial center. And Denmark, again, a country with a strong agricultural exports and related interest in joining the common agricultural policy. So these uh, countries entered with perhaps different expectations. Uh, different uh, different dispositions and different political contexts. So here we'll we'll hear from the three experts uh, on uh, on those countries on uh, what at that time enlargement or accession to the EU meant for them and what uh, and how did the political elites of those countries approach the applications? What had, what had they hoped to uh, to achieve by EU membership? What were the kinds of uh, futures they imagined in the European Union? Uh, second. Um, the, the panelists will also focus on on how accession to the European Union was communicated to the domestic audiences. How was it sort of sold? What were the narratives around accession in the three countries? Uh, and finally, 
what, what, were the actual, what was the actual experience of membership, the decades of membership, and how did, uh, would, did, did it meet the expectations that were there initially? How did it shape the country's identities? Um, perhaps one could ask a question whether, uh, when it comes to Brexit, whether there was something ingrained in the way the European Union or in the position in which the European Union joined or Br uh, Britain joined the European Union back then, that perhaps somehow Brexit was inevitable. So all these questions uh, will be explored. One can also uh, ask whether Danish, whether the Danish no to the Maastricht Treaty in, in 92 was somehow, or, or the Irish no, by the way, to the Lisbon Treaty was somehow related to the kind of, um, you know, expectations uh, that were invested or hopes that were invested in accession to the EU in 73. Uh, so these will be the discussions about the three countries that joined 50 years ago then Afterwards, uh, my my colleague and former commissioner and and professor Danuta Hubner will uh, will relate these more or less historical observations to the more recent enlargement, uh, especially of course the big enlargement of uh, 2004 2007. Uh, and my guess is that also um, she'd raise questions in how how to best manage the various expectations and narrative and uh, narratives in the accession process and uh, uh, and how do they then match. Or, or not match with the actual experience of being in the European Union, um, how to avoid the kind of fatigue or disappointment with actually living in the European Union as members. And what does that mean for future enlargements? What are the kinds of lessons to be drawn for future enlargements, be it in the Western Balkans or in the Eastern Partnership countries? So I would like at this point to also officially from my side, welcome the panel participants. Um, apart, apart from MEP and Professor Dan Tehubna, we have Professors uh, Piers Ludlow, uh, Brigitte, Bridget uh, Lafon, and Morten Rasmussen, and of course, I would like to welcome all the uh, all the other participants. And I'll give the floor now back to Professor Kaiser to start to start the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jemetska, for this very thoughtful uh, conceptual introduction to today's event. Uh, thank you. And uh, we are now going to start, as you've already explained, by uh, three with three presentations on the individual country cases. We'll start with the United Kingdom, not because, in the words of a former president of the European Parliament who told me this the other day, because we've finally gotten rid of that problem, <laughs> but because the United Kingdom's application for membership, of course, first uh, launched in 1961, was, as we'll probably uh, learn from uh, Bridget Lafan and Morten Rasmussen, for different reasons, was important for these two other countries to also launch their own applications. So I think it's for that reason that we will start with the United Kingdom. And the presentation about the United Kingdom's case will be by Piers Ludlow, Professor Piers Ludlow. He's Professor of International History at the London School of Economics. A specialist in the history of Western Europe since 1945, and in particular the historical roots of the integration process and the development of the present day EU. EU. He has published several books, articles, and chapters on the history of the European Union, including a monograph examining Roy Jenkins's presidency of the European Commission, which was published by Paul Grave in 2016. His next book, importantly in this context today, uh, will provide a detailed overview of Britain's 46 years as an ECEU member state. Over to you, Piers. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Wolfram, for that kind introduction. Um, and uh, hello to all of the participants. I can see your numbers. I can't see you all, but uh, I trust you're all there uh, and are interested. OK, so what I was going, going to try and do in, in the 10 minutes that I've been allocated was very quickly review the reasons for which Britain decided to join the European community and a little bit about the atmosphere and the difficulties it encountered in its road to Europe. Uh, and then I want to spend the second half of my talk addressing uh, the question of its experience of membership and the degree to which this did or didn't meet with the expectations with which it had approached uh, the uh, the prospect of joining. So let me go back. Let me start with the motives. Uh, I think the the first thing to focus uh, to to emphasise is that Britain had a cocktail, a mixture of both economic and political motivations. Uh, you sometimes get analysts who will point very strongly to one group or, or the other. I would argue that, that it really is impossible to separate the two. So there are both economic factors and political factors at play. But I think the uniting uh, thread between them is this sense that Britain was declining 
um, that Britain was a, in a sense a troubled country in the 1960s and turning to Europe might therefore help it address and stop this decline. This decline was partly a relative economic decline. Uh, so Britain was actually growing quite respectably in the 1960s, 3% growth. I suspect Rishi Sunak would give his right arm for that at the present moment. But compared to West Germany, compared to France, compared to Italy, in the same period, the British were seen as underperforming. So that was one of the things they wanted to address. But this was also a period of, in a sense, rather chastening geopolitical decline. This was the period when the British Empire was falling apart. This was a period when Britain was seemingly declining rapidly from its status as one of the big three during the Second World War. And when a number of sort of sobering crises, most famously the Suez Crisis, had illustrated the limitations of British power. And again, the hope and expectation amongst the proponents of EC membership was that by joining the EEC, which at the time seemed to be highly successful, the British would be able to arrest both this economic and this political decline. Second point apropos of the sort of pre-accession period uh, that I would make is, I think, to underline the degree to which uh, this was always the, the move to Europe was always a very contested one. Um, it is true that as the 1960s progress, uh, uh, an increasing number of British politicians and British civil servants uh, began to support the idea of joining the EEC. But although that probably was the majority viewpoint by the end of the 1960s, it was never a, a unanimous viewpoint. There were always strong components within both of the main political parties, the Conservatives and Labour, within the civil service and within society much more broadly, who were deeply against the notion of European membership. And so I think it's very important to underline that Britain's turn to European membership was never a unanimous one. I will come back to contestation once it had joined, but the contestation was very clearly there before it had joined. And then the third point I'd make about the pre-accession phase is the degree to which Britain found itself frustrated, uh, annoyed, even humiliated by the length of time that it took to join uh, the European community. Now, of course, in the decades since then, uh, we have all grown accustomed to the fact that enlargement tends to be a rather slow process. And uh, most countries that have joined the EC or now the EU have actually had to spend rather a long period of time in the waiting room, uh, cooling their heels and waiting to negotiate the conditions of entry. Uh, nevertheless, this came as a surprise to the class of 1973 uh, when the British applied in 1961, and I suspect that this would apply to the Danes and the Irish also. The expectation was that this was something that could be sorted out pretty rapidly. On the contrary, uh, and therefore the discovery that actually this would take 12 years to join was a really unpleasant one. Most famously, of course, the humiliation derived from de Gaulle's two vetoes of British membership. So the British were rather rudely rejected by the French, and that was humiliating for the British. But I think more fundamentally, the humiliation also sprang from the realisation that this was a difficult, but also a highly unequal process. When the British had first applied, there was very much the kind of naive expectation that this, that the negotiation with the then six member European community would be a two way street, that this would be a matter of the community adapting to Britain and Britain adapting to the community. One of the hard truths that Britain had to learn in the course of the 1961 to 73 period was that the onus of adaptation lay very squarely on the British and the other applicants, not on the six. The six were not going to change their rules in order to accommodate Britain. It would be a case of Britain changing its rules in order to fit with the community. And that was quite a hard lesson to learn for a former great power. Uh, like the British. So I do think the, the whole road to Brussels was difficult. Uh, it was longer than expected, it was more humiliating than, than expected, and it was deeply contested internally, and that uh, would matter for the longer term also. Turning now to its experience within, I, I would again make a series of points. 
the first and this connects with the 12 year wait on the on in the waiting room of the community as it were was that 1973 turned out to be a pretty bad time to join the european community and again it'll be interesting to hear uh, my two fellow speakers views on this uh, 1973 was of course the year that britain ireland and denmark joined it's also however the year of the first oil shock and the year where what the french refer to as les trente glorieuses the three decades of post-war economic growth came to a crashing end and the world entered a fairly profound uh, economic recession. Now, the reason that this matters in the context of a discussion of enlargement is that this very much destroyed the expectation on the part of those British who had led the application process that joining the European community would usher in a period of strong economic growth. Um, I don't think Britain's economic problems in the 1970s were because it had joined the European community, but they were certainly very real problems and joining the EEC was not therefore associated with the sort of economic success that the founder members had enjoyed, but was instead associated with a period of economic turmoil. And I think that straight away put things on a, on a difficult footing. A second point to make about its experience within uh, is that the political contestation that I talked about earlier uh, during the debate about whether Britain should join continued once Britain did join. This was uh, 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 one of those cases where the wedding bells, if you want, of 1973 didn't end the discussion about whether or not this couple was made for each other, but instead was in many ways just the beginning of a renewed debate. Within two years of joining in 1975, the British found themselves holding their first in out referendum uh, now that was uh, it came to a very different result from the 19 uh, from the 2016 one in that uh, by a two thirds to one third majority the british voted to remain nevertheless the mere fact that it had held this in out referendum uh, and the spectacle of the then Labour government deeply divided between ministers who wanted to stay in and ministers who wanted to get out was an indication of how the contestation about British membership continued long after accession. And this would remain the case for many, many years. Indeed, I remember in the early 1990s, uh, the then British permanent representative in Brussels, David Hannay, making a speech in Brussels where he commented that the 1992 general election, which was just about to be fought, would be the first general election uh, that Britain had ever had where both the main uh, parties fighting it, Labour and the Conservatives, were both strongly in favour of continuing EC membership. And that would turn, off to, uh, turn out to be a once off because, of course, John Major won that election, but his government was then very quickly split over the issue of Europe. And by the time you get to the next election in 1997, uh, the Tories had begun their long slide into increasing Euroscepticism. So 1992 stands out as a kind of aberration, namely the only period where the British were in a sense unanimous that they wanted to be part of the EEC. A third point to make quickly about Britain's experience of membership is the non-appearance of what all British leaders had assumed Britain would gain once it joined the European community, namely leadership of the European community. The One of the points that unites Harold Macmillan, Harold Wilson and Edward Heath, namely the leaders who were associated with Britain's membership bids, was that once Britain joined, it would quickly become a leader of the process. Now, in some ways it did, but it never really felt that way. Uh, I think if you look objectively at the British experience, there were a number of moments where the British were quite important in leading Europe, but they perceived themselves and indeed gloried in their reputation as an awkward partner. They were always the odd one out. They glorified in the fact that meeting after meeting, European Council after European Council, the British leader was, in a sense, the person saying no, 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 or swinging a handbag to think of Mrs. Thatcher, but she was only uh, in many, one of many British leaders to strike these disagreements. And so the British didn't, they expected to lead, but instead they constantly felt, rightly or wrongly, that actually Europe continued to be something that was led by others, particularly from France and Germany, and that became a, a source of resentment. Finally, um, I would end with the observation that despite this dissatisfaction and this ongoing contestation, the British 
and Britain was profoundly transformed by its membership of uh, the European Community, the European Union. Uh, we spent 46 years within the, the ECEU, and although that time was full of fights and battles, it was also a time when the British economy, when British society, when British politics, when many aspects of the British way of life, from the way in which we play football to the fashion in which, what we eat and the way in which we greet one another, all of these things were profoundly transformed by a European uh, membership. And one of the reasons why Brexit has proved so traumatic is that in a sense we are still discovering how much of our day-to-day -day assumptions, how much of our expectations of what normality was, were actually wrapped up with British membership and it's only now that we've lost it that we're beginning to realise that the expectation of easily being able to cross the channel, to take just a topical example, or the expectation that Spanish tomatoes would quickly find their way into our shops, all of those expectations turn out to have been predicated on a European membership that did transform us, even though we were, on the whole, very loath to acknowledge that it was doing so. But I'll end there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Piers, for these very insightful uh, comments. I remember or recall that George Brown, the Labour Party foreign minister, very pro-European, in the late 1960s, said to the German, his German counterpart, Willy Brandt from the German Social Democrats, Willy, let us in so that we can take the lead. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, but we can perhaps come back to this uh, later, whether the British preoccupation with leadership was, as has been prominently, I think, discussed in the context of the Brexit, Brexit referendum and the experience since then, was one uh, where you either dominate or you're dominated. And it was difficult, perhaps, for British politicians to get used to the idea of co-leadership or cooperation in leadership, or however you want to phrase it. Okay, but we may come back to this later, of course. We'll now move on to the second accession country from 1973, which is the Republic of Ireland. And uh, Bridget Lafan will talk about the Irish case. She was director and professor at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence until her retirement in August 2021. Previously, she was professor of European politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at the University College Dublin and was also vice president of UCD and principal of the College of Human Sciences from 2004 to 2011. In 2012, she was awarded the Thesaurus Award for Outstanding Research on European Integration. Her latest book, The EU 27 Response to Brexit, co-authored with Stefan Telle, has just come out with Paul Grave Macmillan. Bridget, we are very happy to have you here today with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And obviously, to distill 50 years of Ireland's engagement with the EU and then the reasons for its membership uh, is difficult in 10 minutes. But what I will try to do is distill the fundamentals. In terms of the reasons for Ireland's membership of the EU, the most important thing I think to say is that it was a project for Ireland's future. It was the culmination of an internal change in domestic economic policy from the end of the 1950s onwards. Ireland, right through the 1950s, had remained very protectionist. In 1958, the then uh, Prime Minister Taoiseach Sean Lemass and his most senior civil servant decided Ireland needed a fundamental change and needed to look outwards. So Lamas, an old man in a hurry, wanted to shape Ireland for the future. So it was very much future oriented. And despite the fact of the vetoes of Ireland's membership during the 1960s, the constant refrain was prepare, 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 because Ireland will be an EU member state at some stage. The second reason was, of course, dependence on the United Kingdom. Ireland still in the 1950s into the 1960s was a regional part component of the British economy, heavily dependent on exports to the United Kingdom and particularly of agricultural products. But EU membership held the beguiling prospect that it would deliver freedom and sovereignty. In other words, not only did Ireland have to go join because of dependence on the UK, but it could, through membership, become interdependent with the UK. And the third was prosperity. That search, Ireland was the first 
wholly poor state to join the EU, with per capita incomes of about 50% the EU average still in 1973. So it was other countries had joined with regional problems and poor areas, but Ireland was a poor country when it joined. And just to give you a sense of that, uh, mortality rates for men were sick, uh, men lived to on average the age of 68 and women to 73. That's the Ireland that joined in 1973. But it also was the settled will of the Irish people to join. And in a referendum in March 1972, 83% of the Irish electorate voted to join the EU. So it was not contested, nor were there divides within the political parties. There was only one par uh, political party in Parliament that opposed membership. That was the small left wing Labour Party. But it, in fact, went into government within months of Ireland's membership and fully accepted the will of the Irish people. So unlike the United Kingdom, EU membership was not contested in the political elite, nor was it contested in Irish society. And that was a huge advantage because it meant that there was a comfort in being a, an EU member state from the beginning. In terms of the narratives and what the Irish thought they were joining and what they thought they what what their sense of what was at issue, I would say the first was that a sense that Ireland was a very young state, 50 years, but a very old nation. And that just like the uh, Big Bang enlargement of 2004, Ireland's membership of the EU was a return to Europe, that empathy with the continent, the existence of Irish colleges historically throughout the continent, that link to Catholic Europe, uh, and also the fact, and I think it's not well known, but uh, for example, a quarter of the generals in the army of Mary Therese of the Habsburg were Irish, and there was an Irish brigade in the French army until the revolution. So there were very strong continental links that were refound through membership. And an Irish nationalist, Thomas Kettle, who in fact died fighting in the First World War in the British Army, said, my only counsel to Ireland is that to become deeply Irish, she must also be European. So there was a, again a sense in the narrative that there was no there was no conflict between Irishness and being European. It was it set it could set, sit together. So it was in some sense a recovery of an old Ireland a discovery of a new Europe and a prospect for a better Ireland for its future. There was a commitment to the European project. And although the Irish were in no way maximalist or federalist and still are not, there again was a sense that there had to be, if you joined, you joined to something that would is something that was going to change and you had to, in a sense, help shape that, but also be open to that. Uh, and then, of course, there was two other important elements in the narrative. One was that in a deep, deep sense that the pooling of sovereignty would, in fact, strengthen Irish sovereignty. It was not something sovereignty was not being lost. It was being enriched. And then, of course, uh, the prospect of it, it, the economy. There was, again, a very strong narrative uh, around the economy. So. Poor Ireland joined in 1973. There were fears that this poor small state could not cope with the demands of membership. Uh, there was a certain sense in which it had to find its way. So then what was what's the experience of of membership being for this small and poor state? I would say, firstly, there was extraordinarily easy adjustment for the political and administrative system, precisely because there was an ease with the project. And in 1975, when the UK held its referendum uh, on in out, it was the settled will of the Irish government at the time that if the British voted out, Ireland would not leave. So despite all of the dependence on the United Kingdom and still in 1975, there was no way that Ireland would lose its opportunity of, the, of being a, 
a member state. That again was very settled. The second thing membership did, which was very important, is that it eased British-Irish relations in a pretty fundamental way. It did so by allowing British ministers and civil servants and Irish ministers and civil servants to meet. Uh, and it also helped uh, in the search for a solution to the uh, communal conflict in Northern Ireland. And I would say British-Irish relations were normalised uh, by the Queen's visit to Ireland in 2011. And that's all been changed now, obviously, because of Brexit. More difficult for Ireland was the economic adjustment, the political economy adjustment. And that was partly because the 1970s was a very tough decade with the uh, two oil crises, but also it took Ireland time to learn uh, what it was to be part of a dynamic market like the EU. But that began to change in the in the 1980s. And then in the early 1990s, we had what uh, was described as the Celtic Tiger period, where Ireland went from being a poor country to being a much richer country. And the single market played a fundamental role in this because it reduced the barriers to economic exchange. Ireland was an English speaking country and 25% of all US investment in Europe between 88 and 92 came to Ireland. So in other words, the launch, the launch pad to the single market, which is still absolutely fundamental to the Irish economy, uh, began then and brought with it, uh, brought with it prosperity. And during this time in 1988, The Economist uh, had a front page uh, which basically described Ireland as the poorest of the, the rich. And it showed um, a beggar on the main street in Dublin. Uh, and 10 years later, it had another uh, front uh, cover, which was a shining light on Ireland. Ireland had become the model, uh, the model country. Towards the end of the nine of 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 the uh, 1990s, a hubris set in in both Irish society and in Irish politics. You began to get the beginnings of not your scepticism, but certainly a sense of we we we're, we're almost we've got we don't need the EU anymore. And there was a debate about whether Ireland was nearer Berlin than Boston. Of course, Ireland could have both. It didn't have to choose between uh, Berlin and Boston. But you had very rapid consumption uh, and uh, a, inevitably a banking crisis. And so Ireland found itself uh, at the end of that decade as a Troika country, a programme country. And I couldn't emphasise enough the trauma that was both to the Irish political system and also to Irish society, because it was seen as abject failure that we had the opportunity, we had arrived at a prosperous outcome, and we basically blew it. In other words, uh, the society had, in a sense, uh, drank the Kool-Aid of prosperity. But interestingly, again, the country responded very uh, quickly to that. And there was a determination that you get the Troika out as quickly as possible and you get back to the markets, you rebuild the reputation. But also in this period, uh, the I Irish electorate voted against the first Nice referendum and the first Lisbon referendum. And that's an important lesson because it tells us that even in a country that's very pro-European, you can lose referendums on Europe. And so campaigns matter, commitment matters, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, then Brexit. Brexit was an enormous shock uh, to the island of Ireland. Uh, the safest outcome for British-Irish relations and for the future of Northern Ireland was always joint membership of the EU. That obviously uh, was not an available future. There were two concerns in Ireland. One was, would the Irish economy cope? And secondly, how to solve the problem of the Irish border. The Irish economy has proved again its adaptability and has, in a sense, had a Brexit dividend. Uh, but of course, it has seriously disturbed territorial politics 
on the island of Ireland and particularly in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that is uh, a con that's a real deep problem, I think, that uh, that remains. But of course, what it did, it also proved again to the Irish that membership matters and it gave the Irish a lot of uh, support in terms of the Brexit outcome that Ireland could, the island of Ireland could live with. In terms of neuralgic points in Ireland's membership of the EU, I would say one was, uh, remains, was and is corporate taxation. Uh, the other uh, is security and defence. Ireland is a non-membership of NATO. So very briefly to sum up, uh, the EU is Ireland's geopolitical and geoeconomic anchor. Ireland's major contribution to the EU is to have made a success of membership, to show that a poor country uh, can actually prosper and flourish in the EU. And the outcomes are extraordinary. For example, when Ireland joined, uh, the population of the Republic of Ireland was 2.9 million. It's now 5 million. Uh, 83% of the Irish electorate voted for EU membership, and today 83% of the Irish electorate think the EU has a good future. Uh, and Ireland has been utterly transformed. 20% uh, of the population of the Irish Republic today, of those living in Ireland today, were born outside Ireland. So the EU isn't the driver of all of this change, but it is the context within which this change was possible. So I would say that Ireland's membership of the EU is, in a sense, the other, uh, it's, it's almost unlike British membership on every single indicator. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget. Uh, one point that you haven't perhaps talked about as much as you could have done, and that we can perhaps come back to later, is the profound uh, cultural transformation that Ireland has undergone uh, as a result of membership. At least when you look at it from the outside in the 1960s, of course, the Republic of Ireland is still a staunchly Catholic conservative country, uh, and over time perhaps has become more mainstream in its terms of its cultural attitudes and, and uh, forms of behavior as well, uh, in addition to the socioeconomic modernization that you prioritized perhaps somewhat more in your presentation. Now, before we move on to Denmark, I would just like to invite all the particip participants to ask questions or make comments in the chat. I will come back to that in the question and answers. Uh, two have already done so. And I would also like to welcome Professor Hübner, who's now managed to join us after, I think, a flight delay. Thank you very much. We'll come to you uh, in a minute, of course, Professor Hübner. But uh, now we have to talk about the Danish case a little bit. And talking about the Danish case will be Morten Rasmussen, who is an associate professor at the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. He's an expert on the history of European integration, covering a number of topics, including the history of Denmark and the EC and EU enlargement. Over the last decade, he has been one of the pioneers behind the development of a legal history of European integration the results of which have been published in a variety of anthologies and leading historical and law journals. Most recently has also worked on the history of the League of Nations and international law in the interwar period. Over to you, Martin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaiser, for the invitation. It really is a pleasure to be here today with such uh, esteemed colleagues and friends. I'm also honored to be part of the panel, really, because it's, it's quite a privilege for a researcher to be able to share some insights with members of the European Parliament, employees of the European Parliament. So I uh, have been looking forward to this uh, event. So on the 21st January of 1972, the Danish Prime Minister Jens Otto Kau traveled to Brussels to sign the accession treaty between Denmark and the European Community at the Palais Egmont, together with three other countries. Actually, Norway was also signing, even though they rejected uh, the accession later on. So the day before the ceremony, Karl had dinner with Eichel Janssen, who was head of the State Department, Jens Christensen, who had led the foreign ministry negotiating team, and Danish ambassador to the EC, the later commissioner, uh, Finn Gundelag. So the exquisite Belgian cuisine at Comtiersois inspired a long and intense debate about the rationale behind Danish EC membership. Had they done the right thing? Karl asked this inner circle of the Danish State Administration. To how Western European commercial liberalization and economic integration in the post-war years, if Britain joined the EC, would force Denmark to do the same. If Denmark stayed out, 
the viability of the aquacultural sector would be seriously endangered. Danish industrial exports would suffer, and ultimately the Danish welfare state would become unaffordable. However, the decision to join was clearly, clearly one of the most fateful and decisive of Danish 20th century history. What was, of course, unknown at the time were the future political consequences of EC membership. After a long night's talk, the conclusion of the debate was that even if, which seemed unlikely at the time, the EC might develop into a United States of Europe, this was not necessarily the worst outcome. Considering how endangered, endangered Danish statehood had been between 1864 and 1945, a future as a member state of a peaceful and prosperous United Europe was surely preferable. Today, Kau's prediction has almost come true. Denmark is now part of the European Union that is deeply integrated, although perhaps not truly federal, and has, for all its faults and flaws, becomes a key tool for providing an economic order for Europe and European stability and peace. So in the following, I'll begin by looking back to the decades following the Second World War in order to explain why Denmark joined in 72, and also look at how the road to membership shaped Denmark's position and role inside the EC. And then in conclusion, I will shortly discuss Denmark's experience as member of the EC and then the EU. Britain had along with Scandinavian countries, with the Scandinavian countries, been quite skeptical towards initiatives of continental Europe, partly because the cooperation envisaged in the post-war years would be supranational. However, from 1958 onwards, it was clear, at least to the British governments, that if the common market planned by the European communities actually succeeded, Britain would have to join. So to British Prime Minister in the early 60s, Macmillan, there was no doubt the economic future of Britain would then be in the European communities. Trade with the former colonies of the Commonwealth would not secure high sustained economic growth, as mentioned by Professor Ludlow. Likewise, the Prime Minister of the early 70s, Edward Heath, realized that in the longer run, Britain had to join European foreign cooperation to strengthen the geopolitical position in an Atlantic world where the US support to Europe might eventually weaken or stop. So from 1961 to 69, the enlargement of the EC was at the top of the agenda, but of course, as it's well known, it was blocked by Charles de Gaulle. He stepped down in 1969, and finally the EC was ready for an enlargement. Denmark was politically and economically to be found in the Western camp. As a member of NATO from 1949, Denmark was an integrated part of the defense of Western Europe. With regard to the Western European attempts to cooperate and liberalize trade, Denmark largely followed Britain's lead. When the British decided to join the EC in 1961, Denmark's future was logically also in the EC. All the major NATO powers of Western Europe would then be part of the EC, and around 70% of Danish exports would also be directed to the bloc, including the large majority of Danish agricultural exports. Nevertheless, joining the EC was a controversial move in Denmark. Danish perception on having a unique welfare state and a Nordic democratic model, uh, in contrast to the failure of continental democracy in the interwar period, flourished on the center left and left wing of Danish politics. As a result, opposition to the EC membership was relatively strong in the electorate, and in the two old center left parties, the Social Liberal Party, the Radical and the Social Democratic Party. To most Danes, continental Europe was still seen in this perspective of the interwar period as a danger to Danish independence, to democracy, and to welfare. So when asked about European cooperation, the broad majority of Danes preferred Nordic cooperation. There was little ideological enthusiasm for European unification. The Danish negotiations for membership were conducted first by a centre-right government uh, from 1970 to September 1971, and then by a social democratic government under the leadership of Jens Otto Karl, who we started uh, with in the talk. During the negotiations, the Danish strategy was to have as few demands as possible to the transitional period before becoming full member and with all obligations accepted. Denmark had very strong economic interest in becoming full member as quickly as possible, and therefore tried to behave as a good pupil in the class. However, despite this negotiating strategy, the Social Democratic Party wanted Denmark to officially set out 
potential opt-outs of Danish membership already before joining. It sounds like something we know with Danish opt-outs. This was to appease the skeptics and opponents in their ranks, and it was crucial for Carl to demonstrate domestically that Denmark did not just lay down and let the easy run over Danish interests. Instead, it was underlined that Denmark supported a national veto right in the EC and would not accept any step towards economic and monetary union that was at the agenda in the early 70s, or tax harmonization for that sake, that might endanger the Danish welfare model. So when the new social democratic government came into power in October 71, the new market minister, as it was called, Ivan Erko, traveled to Brussels to emphasize these future opt-outs to a surprise council of ministers. In the end, the conditions of Danish EC membership were negotiated relatively unproblematically, and in reality, the opt-outs concerned not the EC of the day, but rather a potential future. This did not mean, however, that the conditions were not politically important. The, de say, the Danish decision to join would ultimately be taken by means of a referendum. This had been agreed by the leaders of the two parties that were most split on the question, the Radikale Venstre and the Social Democratic Party. The challenge was how to secure a yes vote on a question that had proved more controversial than probably believed by most politicians when the enlargement negotiations began. At the organizational level, both the adherents and opponents of Danish EC membership struggled to offer a coherent electoral campaign. The opponents managed for the first time in early 72 to establish a national organization against Danish EC membership out of the many committees and groupings that had emerged since 1961. However, the people's movement against the EC lacked serious financial donors that would have allowed them to engage in a large scale campaign. Likewise, the adherents of the EC membership struggled, the trade union movement was split, and therefore the Social Democratic Party consequently lacked funding to campaign. And the solution only emerged in the very last month of the campaign where Danish industry financed a pro-membership campaign coordinated secretly with the Social Democratic leadership to emphasize arguments that could convince the skeptical voters on the center-left. The arguments of the opponents of EC membership were mainly political. It would endanger Danish sovereignty, the welfare state, Nordic cooperation, and the opponents did not hold back the scary visions that the Danish would face inside the EC. Women's rights would be rolled back to the level of their Italian sisters. Danish babies would, when they grew up, serve in a new European army that would surely come. And Denmark would join a menacing capitalist association that exploited the third world. In contrast, the arguments of adherents of memberships were both political and economic. The economic arguments were nevertheless the most prominent, and this culminated in the last weeks of campaign run by Danish industry and the Social Democratic Party. Here, the economic benefits of joining were emphasized, and it was pointed out that political consequences would not be too serious. Denmark would not surrender sovereignty on the tax system or welfare. So in the end, there was quite a majority among the electorate that supported Danish EC membership, 63.3%, and 90% of the Danes actually voted, 90% of the electorate. However, underneath this clear victory to the adherents of membership, there was another reality. Opinion polls conducted around the referendum showed that although 66% agreed that membership was economically beneficial, around half of the population opposed the prospect of Danish membership of a future United Europe. This opinion poll showed and reflected the social democratic conditional approach to EC membership. Denmark joined the EC primarily for economic reasons, but it was clear that future integration should not endanger the Danish welfare state model, and it was preferable that the EC did not move too far towards the United States of Europe. So to conclude, this section, you can say Denmark became a member with important reservations from the outset. So considering this very difficult road to, Den to EC membership, Denmark's relationship to the EC would continue to be mixed. Taking here at the end of the talk a look at the period of membership, I think we can conclude economically that Denmark has benefited tremendously from membership and gradually adapted to, a, to become a very successful partner of the Northwestern European members of the EU. The continued integration of the Danish economy into the common single market has benefited Danish firms, and the importance of 
Danish agricultural export ensured that Denmark for many decades were a net beneficiary of the EC budget. Today, Denmark shadows the euro and belongs to the fiscally restrained auto liberal Northwestern European member states. So economically, it's very hard to refute that Denmark in a way found its natural place as a small open Northern European economy into this broader European framework of trade and payments. The story, however, is much more mixed. The conditional acceptance, if you like, of membership really shaped Denmark's relations in the EC in the decade after the Germany. In September 1986, the Danish electorate, if we look at opinion polls, actually support to be in the European community and remain deeply skeptical about any kind of political aspect of the integration process. Big myth was in a way that Denmark was an economic community and therefore any attempt to strengthen institutions were really you know, a break of trust. However, this partly changed after a referendum in 1996 where the electorate supported the single European again, the single market and not so much a strengthening political union as his prime minister Paul Schmidt said, the union is complete. And that's the massive word. So even though we see a political shift in the late 80s where the Social Democrats and the radical events of actually moved more in a pro-European direction, we end up with a Maastricht Tree referendum uh, in 1992, where the Danish population actually comes out with a narrow majority against members of the European Union. So you say there the heritage from the referendum in 72 really kicked in, right? Meaning that the political parties at the end of the Cold War had moved towards acceptance of the new Europe that was made from the core. However, the Danish population, the Danish electorate, still this reluctance against a deeply integrated political Europe and European Union. And this ushered in, if you like, a second chronological period where Denmark, after negotiating for opt-outs um, on defense community, the euro, European citizenship and home and justice affairs, and nevertheless managed to be able to join the European Union with these opt-outs. Several of these opt-outs were later confirmed by, confirmed by individual referendum, including the euro referendum in 2000, where Denmark, the Danish population, rejected with a clear majority you know, to join uh, the euro. However, I would argue that we are actually seeing a change in the last couple of years. So if you like, you can say from the period from the Maastricht Treaty until the last couple of years, until 2017-18, you might have a situation where Denmark was quite happy as a, you know, an opt-out member, <laughs> if you like, of the European Union. We were part of it, but we were not at the core. And I think that fitted the Danish uh, population. However, will Brexit, seeing the consequences of exiting the European Union with the pandemic, and particularly with the now Ukrainian, the tragedy of the Ukrainian war, the opinion polls in Denmark had completely changed. And now we have something like, you know, in the high 70s of a population of the electorate that strongly supports European the European Union, and my uh, so my expectancy of the coming decade is actually that this has created a very significant shift in the Danish electorate in terms of understanding the benefits of Danish membership of the EU, and also finally, if you like, fully accepting that Denmark had found its home in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Borten. Uh, you've already taken us into the future here concerning the case of Denmark. And this will allow me to move very quickly on to the presentation now by Danuta Hübner, who's been a Polish member of the EPP group in the European Parliament since 2009, serving on both the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs and the Committee for International Trade, as well as on the EP delegation for relations with the United States. She's also a member of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs and of the delegation to the EU-UK Partnership Parliamentary Assembly. 
a professor of economics originally. She was chief negotiator for Poland's membership of the OECD, executive secretary of the European Economic Commission, and deputy secretary general at the United Nations. In Poland, she was head of the office of the Committee for European Integration and was also the country's minister for European affairs, overseeing the process of Poland's accession to the European Union before becoming Poland's first commissioner, first for trade, then regional policy. So Danuta Hübner, it would be nice if you could talk a little bit about your experience, uh, not of course of all of the enlargements, but the Eastern enlargement of 2004 or 2004 and 7, and also perhaps relate what our academic colleagues have said about the early 1970s and the period since then in terms of the UK's and the Irish and the Danish experience of membership to any prospects for any future enlargements of the European Union. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Wolfram, and uh, the list of your requests is just extremely long. I, I don't know if I will meet all the expectations, but thank you very much for the idea, for inviting me also, and for adjusting to, to, to also my horrible agenda. And now I'm in the hands of the of the Swedish IT system. I hope it will survive the, uh, the this half an hour which we still have uh, for our meeting. I would like to start by, by very briefly just bringing several uh, kind of um, comments uh, on Europe, which I think are extremely important in our reflection on enlargement. So I would like to say is that for me, enlargement policies actually shows that European Union is a, is a living organism and you can actually see the open door to future integration and enlargement, uh, both territory and content wise already in the Schuman uh, declaration when, when it states that Europe will not be made all at once and also announces the European solidarity. And I, I see actually the enlargement uh, as a supreme expression of these uh, intentions. Um, so the EU has been always on the move and you, 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 you sort of delivered a lot of evidence on this uh, and its history is the one of uh, change uh, still far too often the change uh, delivered in a reactive uh, way. Also, I would say that the tradition of European treaties changes has been rather to codify the past than making them fit for the for the future. Um, that it's important to remember that the integrated Europe is a community of law. It has values cast in stone, and you cannot negotiate them. You cannot just have your own definitions of the human rights or rule of uh, law. But beyond this common foundation, which I think is extremely important from time to time to make everybody remember about it, this community of both states and citizens, as we say uh, today, has always aimed at integrating the diversity. So it was not about bringing together just as the states that fit uh, very well together, but it's about integrating the diversity. Um, and this diversity has been uh, throughout the history of the Union also a source of uh, progress. I also think uh, that what you were saying also would confirm it that each of the seven enlargements actually impacted the, the community, uh, some stronger than, than others. Um, each of them, of course, uh, differently, but I, uh, without any modesty, I would say that this big bank enlargement of uh, 2004 uh, was probably the most consequential for the future of the European uh, Union. Uh, we came definitely from the other bank of the river. And for newcomers, it was uh, important that this accession went hand in hand with the transition or our transition to market economy and uh, democracy. I think this um, a coincidence of the, of the two processes was, was extremely important, I think, for both. Um, and Europe for us in the transition to democracy and market was a guarantee that the changes uh, would be irreversible. And there was this additional value added of the whole process of uh, accession. Uh, accession was for us uh, a guarantee that the changes would be irreversible, but it was also a very uh, transformative experience on, on many levels, actually. It was also a light in the tunnel showing the direction for the for the change and i think it has strong impact also on the transition to democracy and market it resulted in economic growth it definitely resulted was extremely important in political stability and also led to enhanced cooperation with the rest of europe if i can say uh, this way 
it facilitated modernization and led also to improving living uh, standards and also quality of life of our citizens. We, we still use this argument of the quality of life um, uh, that Europe is just now also bringing with the climate policy to, um, uh, to, to Poland. Uh, it facilitated the broadly understood process of modernization of, of uh, all the system uh, systems uh, of the state in Poland. Also, uh, I think it opened um, new educational opportunities, which we uh, cannot, I think, forget when we talk about the Central and Eastern Europe or Central or Eastern Europe in, in more general terms um, and the, the accession. Uh, the, I think the, the 2004 enlargement, but also the subsequent to the 2007 with Bulgaria and Romania, and then 2013 uh, when Croatia joined, uh, were very different, I think, from the Western enlargement, if I can just differentiate between the Eastern and Western enlargement. I think the Eastern enlargement uh, showed what I would call today, I wouldn't say it 20 years ago, uh, what I would call today political courage of the European um, Union, countries that joined uh, were had much lower level of development. It was not just a small Ireland with a bit more than 2 million people at that time, but it was a, um, a huge uh, territory uh, with a lower level of development that joined, not the union, that joined the single market, which I think was all the, uh, all the uh, requirements of the single uh, market. People who joined were, were, were people with huge hunger for democracy. Uh, but also with a very limited experience of democracy and uh, market economy, uh, and we all entered with this baggage, uh, I think, on the on the on our uh, shoulders. Uh, no wonder that the whole preparatory process uh, was longer and and more uh, demanding, and not for political reasons, but also for um, uh, for uh, just transformation reasons. I think in all areas of our uh, life. I would say um, that uh, with this enlargement, I think we realize that basically every generation has um, a chance to change the course of, of history. And I think we we managed to, to use uh, our chance. Uh, I think all new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe had made their choice uh, very clear. Uh, we called it return to, uh, to Europe and there was a um, a big debate also, and um, Bridget mentioned this in the context of Ireland, but in, in Poland we had just very unpleasant, even politically, discussions of, uh, of those who believed we are returning to Europe and those of uh, who were using the language of moving, going, coming, whatever, but not returning um, uh, to Europe. Of course, it did not happen. As I said, it was lengthy, it did not happen overnight. Uh, there were ups and, and downs politically and in terms of the continuity of preparations. Uh, it was steered and coordinated by politicians, but actually engaging all levels of uh, uh, governance, all economic, political and social stakeholders, as well as civil society. And I think this kind of overarching, overwhelming approach converted Eastern enlargement, not only in Poland, I think, into a massive uh, popular uh, movement. Uh, for all of us, it was not only the finally the moment of, of joining, which we celebrated like um, like nothing else, I think, in, in what I remember during my life, uh, but uh, it was uh, actually the effort to prepare uh, for, the, for the accession, um, uh, which had uh, extremely strong value added. So the, the process as such was, was having its own uh, value. Fortunately, at the end, there was the accession, uh, also thanks to the Danish uh, prime minister. Uh, that was the time when, when politics, I think, appeared, especially in Poland, I would say, is Aristotle's common good rather than a technique of uh, a populist nationalistic forces um, of manipulating techniques to manipulate society as we can see it uh, today. I would say that like today, also in 1990s, uh, there was a, a divided world around uh, us with a lot of uncertainties, a lot of risk as well. There were people that fell in love with democracy and started practicing it, that's true. Uh, but there were as well uh, around assertive regimes of autocrats and dictators of all uh, sorts. 
Um, and for us, for the newcomers, I think sovereignty uh, was an issue that was discussed, but I think sovereignty then meant, and I think also it means uh, for us today, the ability to, to achieve uh, our strategic goals. And we know, I would say only too well, that outside the European Union, such ability is not conceivable. And I think we also, uh, in, in general, I would say, because there were, of course, different views, but in general, I think we, we also had believed in it uh, 20, more than 20 years um, ago. And today, nearly 20 years after the, the accession, uh, Poland's place on, on this planet continues to be in the European Union, uh, united, active and assertive in shaping the, the world, the Union capable of building also international alliances of like-minded democratic uh, countries. Um, and, and this is, I think, for citizens, uh, because we have to differentiate, as you know, in Poland between citizens and the uh, politicians in, in power. Uh, so. Poland, uh, Poland's accession, I think, was in this context, first of all, a political process of huge strategic importance. And uh, it was also, um, like in Finland, I think, the issue of security was also, uh, in spite of the fact that we were already in NATO, I think it also played an important um, role. Economically, it was uh, both a challenge and unprecedented opportunity, a challenge because we were uh, I think far be beyond, I think, what Ireland was in, in, in its time. Uh, but it was um, uh, as well a never experienced administrative effort of a country with practically no tradition of civil service, no tradition of administrative coordination and sharing with dominant vertical, with the history of dominant vertical structures, with also decades long low salaries and low social position of those employed in public administration. That was our strong weakness, I think, at the moment when we started to uh, the transition, the democratic transition, but also the preparation for the uh, first association and then uh, accession. And on that, I think we needed really <clears throat> a cultural switch. So when we applied uh, finally on the 8th of April 2019, uh, 1994, if I can say it this way, maybe it will be easier. So my first task um, uh, was to build a, an administrative machinery um, uh, based on the inspiration that I brought from the French system of interinstitutional, as you say, of interinstitutional uh, coordination. Um, we also copied ENA, so France was a source of a lot of inspiration, even though we always believed that President Chirac never wanted Poland to join the European um, uh, Union, but we were learning also from, uh, from others. And I think we really created an extremely efficient administrative uh, system, which practically served us long, uh, long years, also after accession to the European Union. So it was a fundamental structure, administrative structure for coordinating the entire uh, process, bringing all hands across all levels of public administration on the on, on the deck. I will not bore you with with stories uh, about this, but it was quite an quite an effort. Um, but I can tell you that important as all those political uh, administrative efforts were, it would not have worked so well if we did not succeed to wake up among all those involved, a sense of public mission and emotional engagement. I think that was absolutely fundamental. The feeling of ownership, the feeling of responsibility for this epochal public good of joining the European family of democratic um, uh, states. So I'm mentioning it because for us, uh, accession was also an emotional process. And uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, evidence showing how even prime ministers were crying when when we finalized the negotiations in the, uh, under the Danish presidency in, in December 2002. We had to establish, uh, build teams of lawyers, translators, interpreters, uh, centers of information, documentation were established, the research centers were also mobilized to work on, even on the methodology to calculate the costs and benefits of enlargement, because that was for the opposition, uh, anti-European opposition, a very extremely important, actually, uh, issue to show that benefits will be bigger than um, uh, than uh, cost. We had to basically train people um, in, in 
about European policies. Uh, we, we had to also build the capacity of media to, uh, to make them involved on a huge scale communication uh, campaign. We had thousands of teachers across um, uh, Poland uh, providing European education sort of free of charge, I can say, because it was not in the program. It was just there um, uh, after our uh, activities. It was just incredible, uh, I think, uh, effort of, of, uh, of this part of Polish uh, society. Um, and the civil society engagement uh, that was uh, just a massive engagement was also extremely uh, useful. That was the time when the Commission was seen as a friend and not as it is uh, today by the ruling uh, government. Uh, but in addition to, to working very closely with the European Commission, which provided help, help basically on everything, establishing uh, cooperation with member states was also um, an important um, element of the preparation because at that time, as you know, not all the EU member states were kept their arms broadly open to that big bank enlargement of 2004. But in short, I would say that preparing the, the accession um, in, in, in our part of Europe, but especially in Poland, which was the biggest, uh, uh, much bigger than others uh, candidate, meant actually leaving no stone unturned um, on, on, on all accounts. And in this maze of, of challenges, uh, finding a common good, the interest of Poland, was not only a political, economic and social effort, important as they were, but it was also an intellectual and emotional um, effort. And, and that I would like to, to also leave with you this, because I think it played, played an extremely important role in the whole uh, process. There were, of course, sectorial interests, like in, in all countries that you were also mentioning, partisan um, uh, interests. Uh, for some circles, uh, vested interest took even precedence in the whole uh, process. But the most important thing was probably that in Poland, unlike in any other country of those 10 um, uh, joining at that time, uh, in Poland there was also in the parliament an anti-European opposition to politically brutal parties um, that uh, today they don't exist. Uh, but in this context, of, of this brutal fight at the uh, uh, national level, let's call it like, like this, meeting and talking about Europe with local communities, which village leaders, often female uh, leaders, teachers, students, that was actually a pleasure for all of us who were responsible for the whole uh, process. Uh, and there you could confidence and hope actually prevailed. And, and this is also what we have uh, today, when we have more than 90% of, of citizens in favor of and happy with the obsession, with the membership and a very strongly anti-European uh, government. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, what, what is important also to, to mention is that the success of accession depended on the, also on the political will to deliver political stability, because that was uh, also a dividing issue. and. We needed uh, really main uh, political parties to, to, to keep this stability and the platform for this was, was parliament where you, have, you had the opposition there, but you had also pro-European parties that were not currently in the government and they were always just first to criticize the, the whole team that was responsible for the uh, accession of, of Poland. This I think we, we keep, you continue to keep this political uh, incapacity, I think, uh, for political stability, we keep it in our political system in, in, in Poland. That was the time when we didn't use the word fake news, but one could hear a lot of lies about Europe and its uh, integration. In Poland, as you can imagine, I also had to have frequent and long conversation with the church hierarchy. We had to have the church with, with us and not only a Catholic uh, one. Uh, so we took also bishops to, to, to Brussels, and finally we had the church on the pro-European side. That included also the, um, uh, the Pope, and as you might, have, might remember, we also at the end had a referendum. And uh, there was, we don't have the system like Ireland uh, for every change to the treaty, but we had a referendum. Um, and that was, of course, there was a, call, uh, a special communication effort before that. Uh, but the smartest, smartest thing we did about the referendum was to have the president of Poland agree to a two-day uh, referendum, which finally brought close to 80% support for the session. 
What was important also for us, and which was quite a challenge at that time, the union was engaged in two debates, uh, which today look probably, I could say, pretty archaic, though still popping up. Uh, but back then, they produced also concerns, fears on our sides. We saw risks in them. The first one was about the, it was about this famous dilemma, widening versus deepening, and concentrated around the readiness of the union uh, for further enlargement. Actually, this readiness or preparedness was never defined by anybody, but as a political tool uh, that was used, it actually worked uh, when, uh, when needed, negatively, I would, I would say. Um, I also think that the current discontent appearing here and there that Poland and Hungary were admitted to the European Union too early is actually a late spatter of that, of that debate. Um, and I, I think that, that this debate, long dormant, I would say, was given a final blow now by the process of accession of, of Ukraine. Uh, it turned out that I think in the moment of geopolitical and existential crisis, we already as a geopolitical body to undertake extraordinary um, decisions. And the second debate uh, that was also having impact on our accession on the on the EU side uh, was this so-called finalité politique um, uh, debate. Uh, some uh, reduced it to geographical dimension, but here where of course Article 49 was, has always been very clear on, on it, but others focused on institutional shape of European uh, integration. Uh, but finally, also the pragmatic choice has always been uh, to have a step-by-step -step advancement in the integration, so it was uh, also safe uh, from, uh, from that point of view. We were also on the safe side with our uh, enlargement. Um, today, in, in uh, my home country, um, politicians in power, in a way, they squander our opportunity of belonging to the world of uh, democracy. And a lot what we have achieved, and this is just the most frustrated, frustrating element for, uh, for all of us who are involved in this, um, is that uh, a lot of what has been achieved is now uh, at risk. Uh, the, the good sign is, is this big support of the, you know, the Polish society. So let me say that also when I'm mentioning the situation in Poland, because I think to be a credible supporter of the next enlargements and especially of Ukraine's accession, the current Polish government must stop its ideological anti-European uh, aberrations. Um, uh, but let me also say, uh, this will be my last part on which I would like to focus. Um, of, of my presentation, because I always I have always been convinced that enlargement policy is I'm not alone on this, but uh, I have been also um, convinced that enlargement policy is the most important and most effective actually EU policy because it's enlarging the democratic space and peace on our uh, continent. And now when we are all moving to a different world globally, we must uh, give a hard look to the way the EU implements the enlargement. Uh, policy. I actually think that we are, without naming it like this, we are in the process, in this process um, uh, now. Uh, and I belong to also those who believe that if we could have treaty changes now, that would facilitate the, the next enlargements, like it was with the Nice Treaty in the context of 2004 enlargement. And my thanks to, to Brigitte, because I don't know if she remembers that she was involved in the second referendum and I was going there and I was also um, uh, we were trying to convince the Irish because we needed this treaty to have this enlargement. Um, so now we, we also, I think we need a treaty change for, for Ukraine, if I can just use Ukraine as a symbol. Um, it will be the, the fifth largest country in the European uh, Union. So we definitely must look a new decision-making process in the European Union. We must strengthen, definitely, I think, also thanks to Poland and Hungary, the EU rule of law competences and also mechanism of enforcement. We must look at the budgetary system and the way we finance our expenditures. A lot, of course, has happened in this field in recent years, but still things are open. Uh, actually, uh, and then the composition of the Commission has to be put back, I think, on the table for discussion and solution. The, the same refers to the veto uh, power. But as we all know, in the in the European Union, the discussions on changes have always been and will be difficult. Though after the conference on the future of Europe, politicians cannot use anymore this famous excuse that citizens do not want treaty changes because the citizens 
express the, the, the will um, during this conference. Um, uh, so we are now, as, as, as we all know, uh, this idea of treaty change is, is blocked, uh, uh, definitely. I also think that the geopolitical European community, which is proposed, being proposed by the French president for a continent-wide political cooperation, is important but cannot be seen as alternative to, to, to membership. It is not also, I think, a sufficiently strong signal to Russia. In this context, I think it is worth mentioning that accession um, to the European Union normally also implies transition periods, derogations or limited access to certain policy um, uh, instruments. Poland, in Poland, I mean, nobody remembers it, but we had um, transition periods in 12 out of 31 uh, negotiation chapters, uh, which implied um, uh, which didn't imply sort of not fully fledged um, uh, membership uh, of 1st of May 2004. But some of those transition periods were because we needed it, but there were also even transition periods because the EU side uh, needed uh, them. And of course, Ukraine is, is a very different uh, country compared with, with Poland. And we also know that um, every candidate becomes a member of its on their own uh, uh, merits. So some people say, well, Ukraine is a different story because Poland never had oligarchs and related distortions. Uh, Poland was never part of uh, USSR. As we used to say, with all ideological and political uh, consequences, it's true our political systems are different, but we also know that political systems are not among the uh, Copenhagen. Uh, criteria, neither is the level of um, uh, development. It's true that Ukraine is not in NATO and Poland joined the NATO five years before the EU um, accession, but definitely Ukraine is a sovereign state with a, uni is a unified jurisdiction and also has borders internationally uh, recognized. But it is also um, uh, true that accession is not only about closing the chapters and negotiations where Ukraine seem, will probably go very, very quickly. I, I, I talk to them also tomorrow um, a, a, a lot, uh, but uh, they, I think they still have to understand that the accession is not about closing the chapters, it's about implementation and enforcement, what matters. Uh, most on this, I think there is still a lot uh, to be uh, done. Um, so ensuring this this capability to enforce reforms is, is absolutely fundamental. Um, if we manage to also, as the EU, to ensure that reconstruction of Ukraine will not be just about bringing back what they had before the war, but that they will use this chance for leapfrogging to this new different world, which is closer, which will will be closer to the European Union. That will be also a big our big. Uh, success. Um, and, and I think that uh, Ukrainians understand very well that they must be well prepared. Uh, I think it is each time we tell them this, it is well taken by, by them. So that's absolutely clear. Uh, and the, I think the best, the most, uh, the best news I would say that I see um, is that there are Ukra in Ukraine leaders who understand the need for a for a deep transformation of the country into a democratic uh, participatory place with viable working institutions of the state and really open, competitive, pluralistic political uh, uh, space. And also when you look at this process from more from global uh, perspective, Ukraine in the EU will mean an enlarged space of democracy in, in the in the world, and we all know that today this contest between democracy and autocracy is a defining challenge of our time. And having Ukraine within our democratic fold, we will increase exponentially our chances of winning in that dramatic contest uh, globally. So uh, that's uh, the path for Ukraine. I think should be clear. It should be Europe irrevocably. But I think it, it's important now to, to ask and um, uh, whether our approach to enlargement makes this policy really fit for um, uh, for the for purpose uh, today and and and, and tomorrow. Uh, certainly, the, the Russian aggression provides an entirely new context for the European security framework and also questions European sovereignty in terms of our capability to deliver on our um, uh, interest. I think what we did, which was this quick formal endorsement of the candidate status, was the only uh, available politically uh, rational uh, response. So I think we passed the, 
uh, the test. But generally, if you look at the neighborhood policy or partnership, Eastern partnership policy, I think it has been a, a, to a large extent a failure in terms of uh, achievement, achievements. Of course, Belarus is a flagship example um, here, but this policy did not protect our biggest neighbor also from atrocities of this right um, aggression of, of, of Putin. And we, it's not difficult not to see the presence of Russia, China, Turkey, and, and also in Western Balkans. So I, I, I think that we are lucky that Ukrainians understood that they, they see this aggression as an attack on, on democracy um, and European uh, values, and also on their continuing commitment um, to U Europeanize the country and their uh, life. So um, today, I think it is legitimate also to, to ask whether this uh, candidate status today has sufficient practical relevance in our uh, policy, because we know uh, those examples of many years and decades um, uh, of, of candidate status in, in some uh, cases. And I think that what we call now acceleration is actually shortening the bureaucratic procedure is, of course, it's important, but it's not a new uh, strategy. So I think that uh, adding this to, to, to this landscape that we, for us, it's first of all Ukraine, but if we add the whole post-Soviet territory that is just also having this aspiration and also Western Balkans, uh, we need a new strategic approach to, to enlargement. Um, there's a lot of ideas around and uh, uh, looking for mostly for alternatives to, uh, to enlargement. Um, there are also some good proposals. The European Council on Foreign Relations uh, also have, has a kind of, uh, they call for a pragmatic approach. They call it partnership for, um, uh, for an enlargement. But it, to my view, it, in my view, it just looks like what we know from the past, which was everything but institutions type of enlargement. So uh, well, we can also discuss um, uh, about that. But I think we we are uh, facing a challenge of epochal importance, and our geopolitical situation has been transformed profoundly. Profoundly, and uh, we have to rewrite the neighborhood and enlargement uh, policies. And we see that our candidate countries are also geopolitically vulnerable, um, that they continue with European um, aspirations. So we have to find a way to anchor them more deeply rather quickly before China and Russia will offer them their values and, and uh, principles. The good thing, and with this I will finish, the good thing is that the Commission, without really sharing it maybe strongly enough with the rest of the world, is doing a lot of additional mini agreements with uh, uh, Ukraine and coring them more deeply in a variety of policies and, and, and programs. Uh, so I think that the process of phasing in Ukraine in, into membership framework is already there, being done in a pragmatic uh, way. They, they have back-to-back -back consultations They are permanent. They are updated regularly action plan for integrating Ukraine into the internal market, which includes also the, the roaming, the single payment area, and soon probably also strategic partnership on renewables. So a lot is happening in terms of concrete steps to bring Ukraine closer uh, faster. But it's true, it's a country at war, and they have to do much more on anti-corruption. And uh, there are worries whether in the post-war situation we might see multidimensional lack of stability uh, also. But Russia, and that's my... Uh, I hope we, we, all, we share it um, in, in the European Union. Russia must get a signal from the Union on how we see our preferred interinstitutional order in, in Europe based on, on democracy, based on uh, freedom. I think Putin's imperialism woke us up, and it, but also it confirmed that world is a dangerous place. So I think that we should use also a Ukrainian accession as a counterforce to um, uh, to that and uh, thank you I... thank, thank, thank you very much uh, professor Hübner, for this tour de force uh, which has connected historical discussions about the enlargement of 1973 via the eastern enlargement and your own experience of course in your various roles working for the polish governments with accession of poland and of other eastern european countries to the question of future enlargement and particularly of course to the issue of uh, the Ukraine's accession to the European Union. We have, uh, and I think that's only a reflection of the complexity of the topic of enlargement. We have very little time left. We're already a little bit over time, but we have some questions from the audience, which uh, ironically are actually 
uh, related to the period of the 1960s before the actual enlargement of 1973. Uh, I would just like very quickly to uh, mention these questions and perhaps I can ask Piers Ludlow because he's also worked on this to deal with these questions very briefly uh, before some final uh, comments from my side. Now, first of all, there's, there are two questions by Julian van Hout and Pavel Czernow, if I've read this correctly. Uh, one was about the question why the first UK bid or the other associated bids failed in 1961-63 and uh, to what extent there was a coordination among these countries after the Gold's veto of 1963. And then there's a question which in any case directed at you in any case because it's about the United Kingdom. Why is it that around 1992, as you explained in your lecture uh, or in your contribution to this discussion, the United Kingdom or the political leads of the United Kingdom were for once and for a brief period of time more united on the desirability of membership of the European Union? Because if you could answer these uh, quickly, that would be really helpful. On, on the, the, the early failures, I, the, the simple answer is de Gaulle, and there is a school of thought that would basically say that enlargement would have gone ahead had it not been for the French veto. I actually think it was a bit more complicated than that, and I think one of the reasons why the, the initial British bid fail, fa failed was that the British had not got their heads fully around what it meant to join the European community and the degree to which they, rather than the six, would have to make uh, sacrifices and, and to make concessions. But that is an open debate. Fundamentally, though, it was de Gaulle and it was de Gaulle because I think he realised that the British might challenge him for the leadership of Europe that he was uh, he was content to fill. So there's a famous Macmillan soundbite about Macmillan saying there was only room for one cockcrawl on the European dunghill. Uh, and I think that does capture quite well the the, the 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 thinking behind de Gaulle, um, the uh, question of coordination, uh, surprisingly little. Uh, I think is the answer there. The, the, there was a little bit of discussion amongst the applicants. There was a little bit of coordination during the 1970s. But actually, what was interesting was the degree to which these were a series of kind of bilateral, so between the community on the one hand and the each se separate applicant on the other, rather than, as I think the applicants themselves might have wanted, a much more general conference about how we rebuild Europe uh, to suit all of us. I think that's what the applicants might have wanted, but the community was very clear that that was not what they were going to get, and instead they were they were split up. On the question of 1992, well, I think the simplest way of putting that is it's the moment when two, in a sense, lines intersect. So the story of the Labour Party in Europe is a story of how a, a party that in 1983 had fought a general election on the platform of wanting to withdraw from the European community slowly changed its mind on Europe in the course of the 1980s uh, and under the leadership of Neil Kinnock in particular became much more pro-European. That line crossed with the line heading in the opposite direction of the Conservative Party, which had traditionally been the supporters of European integration in Britain, who um, under Mrs Thatcher began to have some doubts and by the late 1990s had become a very clearly sceptical party. But 1992 is the moment when both of those lines cross, if you want, um, and they cross at a point where both of the parties are still in favour. But it was a kind of momentary aberration rather than, as the speaker that I alluded to in my original comments probably hoped, a sign of Britain finally coming to terms with its European future. Thank you, Piers. Um, there are a number of questions about other countries, naturally, even the question whether Norway will ever join the European Union. Uh, of course, there are also questions about the Western Balkans and especially the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm afraid we don't have time today because we're already over time, running over time to discuss these questions, but maybe we can come back to that at another event. I would like uh, to um, uh, close this with giving by giving you an opportunity to perhaps pick one of three topics that I have distilled from the discussion, if you like of uh, enlargement from the perspective of the member states or the accession states, then Uta Hübner has of course also talked, and that's a very important point about the question of the European communities or European Union's preparedness or attitudes to enlargement. But we focus mainly on the question of the accession states. So three points that I've, um, uh, that have, um, I've 
managed to distill out of all of the different presentations and perspectives. One is how do you as an accession state create or shape or co-shape a form of national identity or patriotism or nationalism, if you like, that is easily or relatively easily compatible with the idea of sharing of sovereignty. That seems to be a concern for many accession states to the European Union and perhaps even including some Eastern European countries who have never been sovereign states before all sovereignty has been violated brutally, as in the case of Poland on different occasions, as in the divisions of the 18th century or during the Second World War. So that would be one uh, question. Then Danuta Hübner managed the question of capacity of the accession state. And you uh, talk mainly about the question of the administrative capacity. I think that this is perhaps also a question of the political elite's capacity to manage the process as well as the narrative. And that would take me to my last point, the question of managing expectations. I recently came across an opinion poll which said that 80% uh, of Ukrainians believe that within 10 years of acceding to the European Union, they will be as rich as the average GDP is in the European Union nowadays, which appears to me to be a very optimistic perspective. So my question here is how important is it for political elites or others like the media to manage expectations to make sure that they are realistic and that they don't lead, as perhaps in the case of the United Kingdom, to disappointments with the actual experience of membership. So my suggestion is that perhaps if we uh, go in a different or in the same order, perhaps we let's do that. Uh, if, we, if we start with Piers, perhaps if you have an observation on any one of those three topics, please, very briefly, because we're already uh, run out of time. Well, I think on the on the point about sort of the compatibility of national um, national attitudes or national sense of patriotism, I do think that's a problem the British have always had. Um, I, I think they, the, too often this was viewed as a kind of uh, almost a technical decision to join to join Europe. There was no fundamental reflection about whether this changed what it meant to be Britain, what, what it meant to be British. There was no real reflection about how British sovereignty could be made compatible with European sovereignty. There was no real sense of multiple identities. I think I'm a I'm a bit of an aberration in that I am British, but I also feel European. But I'm not certain that very many of my fellow countrymen would really have honestly been able to say the same although interestingly the only people this quite a lot of british have discovered how european they are only after brexit and only after that europeanness has been in a sense removed so i do think that is an absolutely crucial point but i'll limit myself to that one thanks thank you bridget the point about capacity both political uh, both political and administrative it's really important because to be a member state of the EU is very demanding. It's demanding in terms of the key implementation, enforcement. It's also demanding in terms of the, uh, the, the, the dynamic of integration itself, because no one quite knows where the system is going at any one point or where it may end up. So it's important that countries have a capacity to scan the horizon within the EU to enter the negotiations very early on neuralgic points because if they let things get to too close to the end it's too late so in other words the ability to influence to shape to prioritize i think for small states in particular they can't cover the gamut of what the eu does so they must prioritize in terms of the the, the, the key priorities and then also uh, there is what I would call the bringing it back home. I think it's really important that political elites constantly communicate with their electorates about what being a member state is. And there's a tendency because the EU is complicated or any one dossier can be complicated to think that communicating Europe politically is difficult. It's not difficult. It's just not done very well. And so I do think that being a member state and, and then finally, and this relates to Ukraine, but to all accession states, EU membership is not the solution to a country's problems. It is simply an opportunity for a country, a context within which countries can find solutions. But if any member state, any uh, aspiring member state 
thinks that the day you join is the day you cease to have problems or that there is a crock of gold at the end of the rainbow a la uh, being very wealthy within 10 years, then that is a recipe for failure. EU membership is simply an opportunity. Thank you. Martin? Good. Okay, now the sound is on. I heard the sound was very bad at the last part of my presentation, so I would like to make excuses on that. I, I think I need to call my internet firm, to be honest, uh, and talk with them about that. But, you know, addressing a couple of your, of your points, uh, uh, Professor Kaiser, I think one thing is this, how do you shape an identity on understanding on the need to share sovereignty, right? I think that has a kind of a double edge to it. On the one hand, I think that if we go beyond continental Europe, in particular in Scandinavia or in Britain, there is a generational, we know we have to be patient in a way, because this is about generational change. I think the older, and I think also we saw that in the Brexit uh, referendum, right? That at the, if we look at the older part of the population, it takes time to adjust to Europe and not everybody takes the road. Whereas if you look at the younger generation, and I think that also applies very much to Denmark, you know, being part of the EU, having these abilities to travel around, taking jobs, studying, etc., and also looking at the union as a framework for solving climate change and questions like that, I think makes a lot of sense to the younger part of the generation. And therefore, they, they have become and they probably feel much more European than the older generation. So there's a slow moving train coming, if you like, in that sense. On the other hand, we shouldn't be too constructivist here, right? In terms of we can shape identity because sharing sovereignty also means that policy making becomes very real at the level of the European Union. And not every state, not every electorate of a member state will share the same values or beliefs in terms of how that policy making should be done. So there, there simply is continued contestation and I think there will be politically about what the union actually does and if it does it well enough. And that will spill into the question of, okay, are we actually happy with the union at the moment? Let's say handling the euro crisis uh, in the last decade, et cetera. You know, not every member state for very good reasons were very satisfied with how that was done. Then just the, finally, taking a look at the managing uh, expectations. That's also a little bit, and I understand that in this context, uh, taking a look from the side of the political elite, but I think one of the big challenges of managing, uh, let's say, expectations or how you would phrase it about the European Union is that the Union is developing all the time and sometimes very rapidly. Whether it was in the late 19. 80s and early 1990s, where the European Union was created, the fall of the Berlin Wall, etc., or in the last couple of years, from the pandemic to the Ukrainian war, where we see a rapid cementation and strengthening, actually, of the coherence of the Union. I think that's what we have seen in the last couple of years. And things like that move very quickly. So it's very hard to say to an electorate, okay, we joined the, you know, the European Union in the 2004, 1973, and it's, and you know, we still have in the old Danish debate, why is it not like 73? Yeah, but the world has changed, right? And this is a rapidly moving object. How to manage expectations about that? You know, I'll leave that to the parliamentarians here. I think that's a very steep order. Thank you. So it seems that the European Union has changed a lot, but Denmark is still in 1973. <laughs> Danuta Hübner, you've got the last word. Can you unmute yourself? I am actually now we can I am hear you. I am unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. So uh you put your fingers on, on things which are extremely important and for years with us. Uh, first of all, I think uh for the political elites, I mean we, we cannot change it. That this blame game continues for decades, I think, since the union was born. We we continue, we have it for five days a week. We are criticizing the union, blaming Brussels for making decisions which are controversial for for us as ministers or governments, and, and then uh, we have referenda or, or uh, big events on Sunday. We are surprised that people are um, are against the European Union. So we have to change the, I think, 
the, this is very difficult because we have every year probably elections in the European Union, new governments come and go and to change the political elites uh, attitude and understanding of the damage they are doing by, by sort of distancing themselves from decisions, their own decisions in Brussels. This is something which is extremely damaging. Second thing I would like to say is just um, the, the way we, we communicate Europe, we still have this hope. Yesterday I heard it from uh, from people I, I talked with, young people in Poland, that there is this expectation that the Brussels, that the Commission will do the communication. The communication should be done by the mayor of a small town or a village uh, who lives around the corner, whom people know, who knows the names of the streets and who can link European Union with the local life because it's not about Brussels really. European Union starts and is built from locally and then it just grows. So I think unless we understand that it's not about uh, the commission directorate to, to do it, but it's about commissioners. There was a year, I think, in the previous uh, term, there were the commissioners were also paying like 200 visits a year uh, to, to member states. MEPs, what we are doing, I think most of the colleagues come on a on the national list, they don't have the proper election, so they are not really communicating with people on European uh, Union, except maybe for moments of of, uh, of elections. So we should all just understand the involvement, personal involvement of all of us and of local people in communicating. Otherwise, we will not make it. And third, uh, the education is fundamental. We don't have education. We have an education, the history of the European Union, what happened in which year and what is what individual institutions do, but we don't have education about the links, the involvement, the importance, the sovereignty, the all those things that you asked us. I think this should be part of the discussion at school uh, as well. And I, I think we, we otherwise we will not build it because not much has changed on all those issues over the last decades, I would say. So there's still a lot to, to, to do and we have to do it differently simply. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for taking time today to participate in this event, which has been hugely interesting. I think the topic of enlargement clearly across such a long period of time and looking into the future is extremely complex. Definitely worthwhile uh, organizing another few events about this question over the next few years, I would have thought. Um, clearly, it's possible to learn from past enlargements or uh, the accession of countries in the past, even when from the perspective of 2023, a country like Ireland or a country like Denmark doesn't look at all like one of the future potential member states of the European Union, say in the Western Balkans. But when we go back to 1973, we can find that maybe some of the accession issues were not so dissimilar from some of those that countries in this part of Europe uh, are facing at the moment. So thank you very much for what I think was been a very exciting event. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists, to all the participants. And uh, I would just like to conclude by drawing your attention to the fact that there's going to be another EPRS event uh, organized in the library of the European Parliament tomorrow and starting at four o'clock about global trade, Quo Vadis, the road ahead to the next World Trade Organization ministerial. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.